hope and sincerely that you have a, a great day. Uh, your pew Bibles, if you want to turn to them, please, to 234, page 234, or if you haven't got a pew Bible, if you'd like to turn to Samuel, the first book of Samuel. I'd like to say that Rose and I have uh, both thoroughly enjoy uh, coming to church here. Uh, I've been to a lot of churches over the years. Um, we wake up Sunday morning and we look forward to, to, to actually to come here and to be at church and to be with you and to praise and, glorif and glory in our, our wonderful God. This week I was reading in, in Psalms and there's this beautiful psalm, you don't need to turn to it, in 119 and it's one verse and it says, The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. The unfolding, I love that term, the unfolding of your word gives light, gives knowledge, gives understanding to the simple. So my endeavour this morning is to unfold God's word and then leave it up to you and to the Spirit of God what you see, what you understand, what's pertinent to you and what you comprehend. Let's read, and I've got to read this this morning, this narrative. I just ha I have to read it. I can't brush over it because if you're like me, you love stories. Narratives are wonderful. Everybody's got a story, and this is a wonderful story. Let's hit it from chapter 1 and verse 1. There was a certain ra man of Ramathiam, Zophim, the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, an Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, the name of the other was Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival used to provoke her grievously, irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not worth more than ten sons to you? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved. Her voice was not heard, and Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor str strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman. For all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. And then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. And then the woman went her way, ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning, worshipped before the Lord, and then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. 2.21 says, Indeed the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And the young man Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Why has the Lord captured this story for all time? Hannah comes on the scene and then disappears. 
two short chapters, there's a mention, she's there, poof, puff of smoke, she's gone. Why has the Lord captured this woman and the events of her life? This is Israel's history. It's not ours. It belongs to Israel. Like Leah and like Mary, Hannah was God's instrument. God was working out his purposes, working his will and working his plan. He's the God of the past. He's the God of the present. He's the God of the future. He's in the game. He's involved in the game. He's on the cutting edge. And he's ahead of the game. God was working through this situation. He was showing his character. He was showing his consistency. He was showing his compassion for mankind. The book that comes before Samuel is... Come on, people, you're more switched on than that. The book that comes before Samuel is Ruth. Hey, another story about another woman. That story is just, it's from beginning to end, through the greater part, it's a story of death and destruction. Naomi's family is destroyed. Her two sons die. Their families are destroyed. But through it all, God is at work. God is moving. God is working out his purposes. God was in the midst of it. There's four things I want to look at this morning. I've made it really easy for you because I don't use overheads. The first is Hannah's state. We're going to look at Hannah's state. And then we're going to look at Hannah's situation. And then we're going to look at Hannah's response and Hannah's resolve. So you've got state, situation, response, resolve. Easy peasy? Right, let's go. Hannah's state. State means a particular condition that someone is in at a specific time. You remember that beautiful, regal, um, sophisticated woman? And you're all going tick, tick, tick in your minds. Princess Diana, she was that regal, sophisticated woman. I'll just quote you something that she said. There were three of us in this marriage. So it was a bit crowded. Do you remember her saying that? Well, enter Hannah's world. Barrenness in ancient times was the ultimate tragedy for a woman, especially for a married woman. It was imperative to procreate, to further name, to further heritage, to future generations. The hopes and dreams of the husband were bound up in his wife and her ability to have children. Barrenness was a terrible, terrible stigma. We also learn that she was childless. That goes without saying. We, we also learn in the, what we've read that she was loved. Her husband loved her. We also understand from the Midrash, which is an ancient Hebrew text, that she was Elkanah's first wife. But because she was barren, Elkanah took a second wife. So you get the picture? This is her world. Enter Hannah's life. The pain, the abandonment, the stigma, the looks, just the heaviness of the situation. The emptiness of no fulfillment. Can you feel it? You're beginning to feel the weight of it? The dread. Proverbs 30, verse 15, 16 says, There are three things are never satisfied. Four that never say enough. Sheol, the barren womb, the land never satisfied with water, and fire that never says enough. Three things and four things in the whole of creation. And the barren womb was one of them. Hannah was ostracized to the fringe of society. She was dejected. When she opened her eyes in the morning, it was there. When her feet hit the floor in the morning, it was there. When the children were running around, screaming, yelling, playing, or just eating their food, it was there. And Peninnah had children 
but Hannah had no children. Can you feel the weight of that statement? The hollowness, the emptiness, the uselessness. That was Hannah's state. Hannah's situation, situation, a set of circumstances in which one finds oneself. Did you notice those words as we quickly buzz through it? Rival, provoke her grievously, irritate her. Hannah wept, Hannah would not eat. The idea is that this lady, the second wife, kept at it. It just wasn't a one-off. She kept provoking. The intent was to stimulate, to incite, to arouse to anger, to arouse to annoyance. If you just flick over in your Bibles to chapter 2, verse 10, it says, The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven, or thunder against. The same word is used in this passage in regards to Hannah. Literally, to thunder against. The word is Hebrew, ra'am. Exactly the same word. It means to thunder against. This is not just some cat fight. This is war. In verse 6, it also uses the word rival. Rival is a noun, and it means competing with another for superiority. That's what was going on in this family. That's what was going on in this marriage. One was competing for superiority against another. The word is sara. And do you know what it means? It means adversary. It means enemy. So what I'm trying to do is build a picture. You need to get into the situation. You need to get into Hannah and what she was experiencing. You need to get to the depth of the situation. You need to feel the words, the arrows, the animosity. You need to be in her situation, the circumstance in which she finds herself. At every level, Hannah is suffering. In verse 7, just a compact little sentence, and it says, So it went on year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord. Year by year it went on. This was relentless. If you noticed also in that passage, the word her, the, the writer wants you to, to zero in on Hannah. How do I know that? Listen to this. But Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb, and her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. And her is repeated, or the pronoun is repeated ten times. He wants you to zero in on her, on Hannah. He's very specific. The result of this situation is Hannah wept. Hannah would not eat. Hannah was sad. She was ground down. Her life was a misery. Things had come to a head. Verse 8 says, And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? What do you reckon, ladies? What would you say? He just didn't get it, did he? The men don't do well in this narrative. I'm sorry, guys. You don't do, you do, we do. Oh, sorry, I'll put myself in there. We do, or even though I'm on my best behavior. We do not do well in this. To top it off, she had an insensitive husband. He didn't know the state of his own family. He didn't know the condition or the state of his wives. If you look, you might have noticed when we read, we read the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. We could do a message on names in, in this book. Names are incredible. Hophni means tadpole. How would you like to be called tadpole? 
Hophni and Phoenix, but if you buzz over, you'll see now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Worthless. How would you like that written about you? So we've got an insensitive husband that doesn't know the condition of his family. We've got two sons of a priest who themselves were going to be priests who were worthless men and didn't know the Lord. And we've got Eli. Eli that looked at Hannah pouring out her heart to the Lord. And what does he say? You drunk woman. Another insensitive man. So I apologize, ladies and wives, for our insensitivity because we can be incredibly hard-hearted and insensitive. Right, let's move on. Hannah's response. Response, a reaction to something. She goes to the Lord Almighty, and this is the first reference of this name of God, the Lord Almighty or the Lord of hosts. It's Yahweh Sebaot. It's the first reference to this in verse 11. She goes to the Lord in verse 11 and says, And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, and then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. An, an, an inference of being a Nazarite. Her prayer exposed her heart. The deep things of her heart. The belief structure, her belief structure in God. She was God-honoring, she was God-adoring, she was God-trusting. She laid herself bare before God. Nothing was hidden. She was honest before God. She told him her most private thoughts and her greatest desires. She was doing what Psalm 62 verse 8 says. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts before him. God is our refuge. Or God is a refuge for us. That's what Hannah was doing. She had gone to her refuge. That higher power. That rock. That fortress. Verse 17 and 18. I've got to read it to you. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. And then the woman went on her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. When she was in there, something happened. She changed from being downcast and low and depressed. She changed. Her face changed. She went on her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. She changed after meeting with God. Something happened. Something changed. Her face gave it away. Do you know what it was? It was peace. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God's peace permeated Hannah's mind and heart. Hannah's resolve, resolve to decide firmly a course of action. Hannah was a God-honoring, vow-keeping woman of her word. You don't see her disappearing over the horizon saying, Aha, I've got what I want. I'm out of here. You don't see her start a running battle with her husband, Elkanah. You're the most insensitive man I know. You can hear it all. It might even have a familiar ring to it. She didn't do that. She could have spat the dummy big time. No. An emphatic no. This is what Hannah said. My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in the Lord. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. There were four things that she did. The first one, she exalted in her God. We've just looked at that. She knew the source of her strength. 
the source of her peace. Two, she was humble of heart. In verse 11, you might, you might have uh, noticed when we read it, read it through, it says, Look on the affliction of your servant. Remember me and do not forget your servant, but will give your servant a son. And she refers to herself numerous times of being a servant. When she spoke with Eli, she said, I am your servant. Bless your servant. She was a humble woman. Three, she was a loving wife. If you look at verse 19 and 20, and they rose early in the morning, worshipped the Lord, and then they went back to their house at Ramah, and Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time Hannah conceived and bore a son. She called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. Normal relations, normal intimate relations, continued with her husband. Four, she was a great mother. I reckon she was a fantastic mother. She took a mother's responsibility seriously. We've read it. 21, the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord a yearly sacrifice and pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up. Why? Because she was focused on the child. For she said to her husband, as soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him up. Probably about the two to three year old mark when they were weaned. I will bring him up so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. And her husband said, do what seems best to you. She focused on that child. That was her number one responsibility, that God-given child. She focused on bringing him up, teaching him and training him in all those formulative years. Can you imagine that... that um, that um, in verse 19 of chapter 2 where it says and his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice can you imagine that year on year she would go up the anticipation I'm going to see my son I've been thinking about him all year can you imagine the love, the attention to detail, the commitment that went into that robe that she made? Year on year. The devotion, seeking out the fabric, the material, the feel, the weave, the cut, the crease, the colour, individual stitch stitches, sewn at night by the olive oil lamp, the buttons sewn on, each stitch, a stitch of love, a stitch of thought, a stitch of mother's devotion. What's your resolve this morning? Resolve to decide firmly a course of action. Mothers, ladies, soon to be mothers, and one day mothers. If you want a role model, look no further than Hannah. She's fantastic. And to mothers, we honour you this morning. We appreciate you. We thank you. And may God the Almighty, the Lord of hosts, continue to bless you. Thank you.